Well, I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Clemens for that great introduction. And I know I'm competing with the sun out there, so I'm, I'm really flattered that we have a, a pretty full house here. Um, by the way, I wish our cybersecurity was as effective as our aviation security, because as uncomfortable as aviation security is, we have not lost an airplane to a terrorist attack globally since September 11th. And uh, literally every day we are losing huge volumes of data uh, over the internet and in other ways uh, in an ongoing bleed of intellectual property, personal information, uh, financial information, and other things of that sort. So what I thought I'd do is talk to you today a little bit about what I call a whole enterprise approach to cybersecurity. And I come at this um, not as a digital native, but as a digital immigrant, by which I mean not that I was born in another country, I was born in the US, but uh, that I didn't grow up in an age where computers were part of every school child's knapsack. And I had to learn a lot about the technical elements, and I'm by no means an engineer or a technician. I have the great good fortune <clears throat> of looking at these problems from the standpoint of a consumer uh, an architect of security solutions, not someone who actually writes the code or configures <clears throat> the architecture. But I'm hopeful that the perspective of an outsider can be very useful in terms of the way we think about these things because <clears throat> I think there was a survey that was recently done, uh, uh, many surveys actually, in the last year about the number one security threat around the globe and everybody's put cyber at the top of the list. Uh, <clears throat> both because of the amount of money that is affected and because of the potential impact on our critical infrastructure. It's not going to surprise you that um, much of the source of the challenge we face comes from the fundamental shift that the internet brought in the architecture of the way we protect data and information. If you think about the pre-internet age, if you generated data, the default position was to have it be private or closed. It was in your office, it was in your drawer, it was in your safe. Um, you could affirmatively put it out there, but for someone to unwittingly or unwillingly take it from you, they'd have to enter into your physical space and take that information, and that's not that easy to do. What many uh, people don't understand, I know the people here do, but many people in the civilian world don't understand, is that when you put data on a machine that is capable of being hooked up to the internet, the default position is open unless you take affirmative steps to close it. And a lot of people think that <clears throat> um, they don't realize that once you've connected your laptop or your workstation <clears throat> to the internet, you are no longer in control of where that information flows unless you have managed your architecture and your system to protect yourself. And even there, it's not perfect, but at least that gives you some measure of control. Um, I think it's important to get your head around that paradigm shift because it explains why the security of the internet, and I'll come back in a moment to why I think that's actually a bad expression, but why the security of the internet has lagged behind the capability of the internet. It's because the fundamental premise of the internet, which was simply to connect um, a lot of data sources together in a way that would be robust in case other communications failed, the theory behind the internet is we're all trusted. It, was, it began as a military activity, um, and it was all going to be military folks or defense folks that were going to be on it, and it was assumed everybody on the internet was going to be trustworthy and legitimate. But actually, the now the greatest flaw in the internet is the fundamental lack of trust, and it is the inability to determine trust. To use the example of a favorite cartoon of mine from The New Yorker, and this goes back, I think, over 10 years. There are two dogs sitting in front of what was then a workstation. And one dog says to the other dog in the cartoon, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And in many ways, that's the story of the internet. And, the, and that issue of trust is now a fundamental problem. But here's my thesis. <clears throat> We're making a mistake to talk about the internet as a security issue, or even cybersecurity because the problem is much bigger than that. And one of the, the challenges in talking about cybersecurity is, again, for most people, they wind up thinking about how do I protect data in motion? 
How do I protect myself when something is moving in or out or when something from outside wants to get in? And there's no doubt that that is an important element of protecting data, but it would be a mistake to believe it is the only element. Because as I'll explain in a minute, there are lots of different ways data um, can be procured, some of it quite old fashioned. And so the change is not in the way you get the data, it's in the amount of data that, that sits on our networks and what we are now doing with data that we never did before, certainly didn't do 20 years ago. If you open the paper, you see elements of this challenge reported almost every day. <clears throat> Huge amounts of intellectual property theft. Um, other disclosures about personal information being revealed or criminal activity. The recent debates about the collection of information by the government, you know, the NSA controversy. Again, it's about the amount of data that's on the system, uh, and not just the way it moves, but the way it can be accessed from a lot of different points. And even in the commercial realm, as, as uh, Eric just pointed out, um, latent underneath all the discussion we're hearing about privacy is the question, well, how much of my data is out there being commercially exploited and being used for everything from marketing to price discovery to perhaps determining whether someone ought to be hired for a job or not hired for a job, or whether um, someone has something in their health background that ought to affect their insurance. All of these are part of a large set of issues that is broader than just the data moving from point A to point B. And that's why I think cybersecurity, in a way, is too narrow a descriptive term. To me, what this is all about is how do you manage a data-driven world in a secure fashion? Now, when I talk about a secure fashion, I mean a fashion that protects privacy, but that recognizes that privacy cannot be protected without security. Or to put it a different way, if I take your data or you give me your data and I promise I'm going to keep it private, that promise is worthless unless I have the capability to carry it out. And that means security is indispensable to privacy. Where is this headed? <clears throat> well, I think we are literally just at the threshold of the challenges we are going to see in, in terms of protecting data in a data-driven world. First of all, there's much more data available now than was even available five or ten years ago. What we are collecting as a society, not the government, private entities, is exponentially exploding. Locational data, and by the way, not just GPS because they've demonstrated that if you, can tur if you turn your GPS off on your device, there are still very, very minute imperceptible imperfections with the way your device connects to the internet or to the wireless carrier that allows it to be uniquely identified and tracked. Locational data, financial data, educational data, all of which is now being collected at, a, as I said, an exponentially growing date, uh, 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 rate. Health data, we are about to get onto the world of the Affordable Care Act. That is going to result in the collection and consumption of huge amounts of data, financial data, health data, data about your risk and about your behavior. And again, all of that, as we've read in the paper, not particularly configured in a way that has considered how that data is going to be protected. When you add to the massive expansion of data being collected, one other feature, then you really see the power of the change that is coming, and that is analytics. Because the truth is, if you collected gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data and you couldn't look at it, in some ways it doesn't really much matter. You got a lot of hay in the haystack, but there's no way to sort through the hay. But as you know, what has kept pace, or almost kept pace, with the expansion of collection is the ability to use big data analytics to refine it and examine it. And there's the combination of those two factors that is creating a new revolution in data-driven world. Now we come to the next challenge, because right now I'm talking about information that can be perhaps accessed and analyzed with a, 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 a view to understanding and targeting an individual. But what about the ability to actually make the real world behave physically in a certain way? Well, we have industrial control systems. And those systems, like SCADA systems or other systems that control our critical infrastructure, are also now connected to the internet and are also now being literally driven by data. So it's not any more a matter of turning a lever 
It's now a matter of putting in something and having the software turn that lever. But that creates a whole different set of vulnerabilities. Not only the, the, the capability to track what these physical systems are doing, but to actually affect it and make it perform differently, and perhaps to degrade or corrupt or destroy it. Now I want to add to that the latest new prospect, which is what some call the Internet of Things. The ability to take these kinds of control software elements and embed them in ever smaller uh, devices and machinery so that you can literally have a, quote, smart toaster or a, quote, smart grid or a car that drives itself. But remember, if the car drives itself, and you're using software and a wireless connection to do that, someone can hack into the car. And as many of you know, there have been experiments demonstrating that you can use systems like GPS or OnStar to literally control the operation of an automobile. What happens when that occurs with avionics and aircraft? When the desire to have a wireless connection uh, begins to create the vulnerability of an interference with a, a, an engine control system? And part of what happens is as we architect these systems, we don't always think about security. So the importance, for example, of segmenting your entertainment system and your avionic system and your engine control system may not be evident to everybody. The desire to always find greater efficiency may conflict with the fact that sometimes segmenting results in indispensable security. And I'd never like to see us hit the day when instead of taking your laptop and putting it in a separate tray to be looked at, you're told you can't bring your laptop or your phone in the passenger compartment because there's a vulnerability with respect to the software that is managing the aircraft that makes it more dangerous than bringing in a bottle that might have a liquid explosive. So we need to be thinking about these problems. We need to be thinking about them now. So how do we do that? Well, before I lay out what I think is kind of the architecture of thinking about security in a data-driven world. Let me just make sure that we've understood the full range of attacks and concerns that we are worried about. First of all, who are the attackers? Well, it's almost everybody you can think of. There are criminals who are out there getting quite sophisticated in terms of the amount of data that they collect. You've read about uh, penetrations of uh, commercial establishments. Just uh, last December, last month, uh, there was apparently a group of Russian hackers who penetrated into a database operated by the Turkish government that had 54 million data points involving individuals in Turkey. That was, uh, you know, things about their address, other things that were, in, you know, of relevance to the Turkish government, and that was all stolen. And that can be marketed and used for purposes of financial gain. So we have criminals out there. We have corporate cyber espionage, people trying to get intellectual property in order to steal in advance without investing in the research and development that uh, uh, other companies are engaging in. We have nation states and foreign actors that are engaged in either stealing intellectual property or in actually carrying out cyber attacks. For example, in 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia, that invasion was accompanied by an attack a cyber attack on the command and control system. And if you read some of the published doctrine that some countries have put out in terms of cyber warfare, they talk explicitly about warfare on information systems as an indispensable element of preparing the battlefield for a physical attack. Threats come from insiders, disgruntled employees, or Edward Snowden, somebody who, for whatever reason, decides he wants to betray his obligation to his employer. And we have politically motivated hackers, groups like Anonymous or Lulzec or similar groups that for some political reason decide that they disagree with somebody and they want to embarrass them. And they do that by penetrating into their personal email, their personal network, and disclosing and disseminating personal de details in an effort to embarrass them. And by the way, this isn't limited to the office. But, it's limited, but it includes as well attacks on people's home computers and home devices, and even those that family members use. So we have all of these different kinds of threat actors out there. And as many different kinds of threat actors, what makes it really complicated is the attack vectors are very different. 
it's not just about the software coming in over the network that you're trying to protect against at the endpoint. <clears throat> it's not just about the zero-day exploit, the malware that you haven't seen before that gets by your firewall. It's not just about the disruption of a denial of service attack. All of those are part of it, but it's not all of it. There's the human insider, again, back to the Snowden. Again, if the press reports are accurate, this is someone who not only used the position as a systems administrator to range around in a network and steal information, but actually went to other employees and tricked them into passing their passwords on to him so he could steal their stuff. Now, that's not malware. That's an insider classic human threat to steal information. We have data uh, breaches based on the fact of the wireless connectivity between databases. We see this in the, in the course of what, what we sometimes describe as skimming, the ability to take devices and use them to capture the wireless transmissions and download the data that moves wirelessly. In October of last year, Nordstrom, for example, found that cash registers and payment machines were being uh, invaded by skimming devices, which was downloading data. And it's not just, again, wireless and invisible things. There are literally people who are combining physical intrusion with cyber intrusion as a way of bypassing defenses. So again, in October of last year in Brazil, what they discovered was someone at the Bank of Brazil had gone to the Bank of Brazil, an ATM machine, and they had put a false physical front on the machine so that when someone put the card in, that false front had a capability of downloading the magnetic strip and the data on that strip so it could be then sent somewhere else and stolen and used to steal money. In another case last month, a number of European ATMs were victimized when criminals went and literally cut a hole in the ATM machine, inserted a USB stick into the machine, and then used that as a way of downloading data. So the point is, it's not just about protecting against the malware coming over the network. It's about combined physical in, in, and software invasions. It's about exploiting the wireless connectivity. It's about supply chain problems, where you are literally embedding in software or hardware that is being purchased vulnerabilities that can subsequently be exploited. What is the consequence of all this? What is the point of all this? There's no perimeter. There's no endpoint. There's no Maginot line. It's not about keeping bad guys out because the problem is within as well as without. And unless you understand the architecture of your enterprise security holistically, recognizing the threats can come physically uh, across the network, within your own network using a USB stick, with human betrayal or any combination of those. Unless you understand that all, all you're doing is fussing at the corners and doing what the French did with the Maginot line in 1940, building a, uh, a misleading belief that you are protecting yourself. You can't look for a single product and there is no single solution. It is about a whole enterprise solution. So what is my recommendation about an approach to take. Well, <clears throat> um, there are a lot of different ways to skin a cat, and I'm not going to say that my uh, particular approach is the only approach, but I found it useful, and my colleagues found it useful, to think about approaching cybersecurity or data security more, more precisely uh, at four levels, beginning with the top level and working down. And the four levels are this. First, at the very top, what's your strategy? And when I mean your strategy, I mean your business strategy or your enterprise strategy. Um, what, are, what are you in the business of doing? What is valuable to that? What is not valuable to that? What is the relative value of those things? <clears throat> How do you prioritize and use the data in your enterprise or your business? Without a real understanding of that, you can't really begin to consider what your cyber or data security posture ought to be. Second, what is your governance? 
uh, because I don't begin with the technical piece. I begin with the question of what is your policy, practice, and procedure. Without understanding that, you can buy all the technical stuff in the world, software, hardware, it's not going to do you any good. I remember years ago, um, I was dealing with a company that was looking at its physical security. And they were investing quite a bit in perimeter security, fence, wall, cameras, you know, sensors. And we said to them, um, what are you going to do when someone comes over the wall? And there was silence. But they hadn't thought about that. Now, the wall would slow somebody up, and the wall would tell you someone's coming over, but once they're over, what are you going to do? And the point is, without a concept of operations that's going to take you through your entire security spectrum, simply buying stuff isn't going to make sense. So that's the governance policy and, and procedures. And I'll cover, I'll come back to each of these in a little more depth in a minute. The third and only something that you can really intelligently think about when you've figured out your strategy and your governance and your policy is your architecture. <clears throat> How do you configure your system? And again, when I say configure, I just don't mean hardware and software. But it also is your human element, your vetting. How do you determine what privileges people get? All of that has to flow from your strategy and your governance. And finally, is the, there's your operational execution. Once you have your architecture, your policy, your procedure, practices, how do you actually execute in a way to make them effective and come alive and get them implemented? So let me go back and cover each of these four. First, what do I mean by strategy? And I want to drill down a little bit more in, into that issue. Well, you know, different businesses use data in different ways. If you are, for example, critical infrastructure, what is most important to you is the operation of your system, how it actually works in the real world. But you also may have business plans that are important. You may have some personal identifiable information. Uh, you may have uh, business plans or, or, or uh, research that you're doing that's important to you. You need to understand and value those things and also understand their significance to the enterprise in terms of enabling the enterprise. And that cannot be done as a technical matter. That, to me, is a fundamental matter of leadership of any enterprise, because it requires you to connect up your business goals with the tools, the data tools that allow, allow and enable your business goals to be met. When you start asking questions about strategy, you come up with some very interesting sub-questions about how you manage data. First of all, who needs to have access to different categories of data? Is it necessary to keep all the data that you use, or is there a way not to keep it? Because if you don't keep it, it can't be stolen from you. Um, what kinds of warning and consent do you need to convey with respect to data that you're getting from third parties? Um, how do you decide what data needs to be encrypted or not encrypted? What should be held closely within a small group, and what should be widely disseminated? Are there ways to manage the data, again, consistent with your business goals, that allow you to have some people see the data that goes in, but not what comes out, and vice versa? All of these questions cannot be answered without a firm understanding of what you are trying to use data to do in achieving your business objectives. Because remember, the only way to protect all data all the time is simply to shut down. Then no one's ever going to get your data. But since you can't shut down, you've got to be able to prioritize and understand what has to be open, how much, and to whom, and how that affects your business enterprise. Having a good understanding of the strategic layer of this analysis is important for two other reasons. First, part of what you're going to need to do to come up with your governance and your architecture and your operational plan is to understand what your strategic threats are. Who might want to come after your information? Is it a nation state if you're operating an industrial control system? Is it a business competitor if you're in pharmaceutical research and development? Is it a criminal if you're managing a lot of consumer information? Without an understanding of who's coming at you, there's a tendency to overinvest in things that are probably not really serious threats. So a big part of the strategy is not only what are my goals in my business and enterprise uh, opportunities, 
but who is likely to want to get my data and interfere with it or steal it? And finally, without a strategic overview, you're not going to be able to engage the very senior leadership of any enterprise in investing in the security that's necessary. Because in the end, whether you're a government or a private sector company, you can only justify spending money on security if there's a return on investment. That doesn't mean it has to produce revenue, but you need to see a direct connection with ultimately the success of the business or the success of the government agency. And that means that top leadership has to be engaged, and that can only happen with a strategic appreciation. So that's where we begin, with the strategy. Now let's step down. Once we've identified the assets that are most critical and how they fit with our strategy, we need to define how we plan to protect them, and that's about governance and policy. Governance are things like standards and processes, or how we define processes. It talks about whether we want to require encryption, uh, what kind of logical and physical linkages and access there ought to be, who ought to have access, what kind of privileges they ought to have. In addition, it, talks, it, it, it addresses the question of audits. How do we review and monitor and make sure that our processes are working the way they should and that they're effective and that they're changing dynamically as the threats change? Another element of governance is education and what we sometimes call cyber hygiene. How do you make sure that people are not your weakest link because they understand the critical role that their behavior plays in reducing vulnerabilities. We all know that there's a significant number of vulnerabilities that wind up coming in, not because someone's cleverly come up with a zero-day exploit, but because someone has been fooled into downloading something or visit visiting a watering hole and opening something up uh, that's malicious. So all of those elements are part of governance, policy, and procedure. And Without that, you can't really build your architecture and your operations. Once you've got your governance and your policy, and you've made these decisions based on your strategy, now we come to the issue of architecture. And you know, there's all kinds of different standards out there. There's ISO, there's NIST. <coughs> um, there, there are new standards that are being developed now by the US government that are going to be voluntary. But you can't really think about these intelligently unless you understand why the architecture is important in terms of your governance and your strategy. In other words, it's got to be configured not just as a check-the-box exercise because someone published a list of things and I got to show I did all those things, but because it actually enables the two higher elements of your, of your stack. What architecture is about ultimately is how do you knit or combine things together and how do you manage complexity so that you can take this thing you've knit together and still manage the security based on individual pieces that may need to get enhanced security or enhanced protection. It's about both combination and management. And most important, the architect's job is to capture in replicable, buildable parts a vision of where the operation might go and how it can be expanded and scaled. A big piece of this, by the way, comes up with enterprises that acquire other enterprises and find out, first of all, they didn't realize what they were buying because what they're buying is riddled with vulnerabilities and, and problems. And second, they don't really understand how to combine it without creating new seams and new vulnerabilities. All of this is part of architecture. To be more specific, our security architecture has to allow us to account for all of our critical data assets, to configure them in, some way so, in, in such a way that we can monitor them and make sure that we can constantly be on the lookout for vulnerabilities, for exploits that might be operating within parts of our system, and also to watch to see how things move within the architecture. To put it kind of in more simple terms, if you decide you're going to segment the information, and certain people should look at some things, but they have no business looking at something else, and you start to see data moving within your network 
from someone who ought to be looking at it to the workstation or the, or the device of someone who has no business looking at it, you need to know that. Your system has to be architected in a way so that is visible to you. And then you've got to build the capability of sensing within your network as well as at the endpoints that allows you to detect that relatively quickly. Without that, there is simply too much to watch and too much that can happen below the surface. Having the proper architecture also allows you to use some powerful tools like anomaly and pattern detection. Because if you have a well-architected system, you can, in an automated way, detect when there's a break of a pattern, when there's something anomalous, and again, to focus on when that might violate a rule or something that your governance and your policy have established as an important priority. And again, the architecture is about people. <coughs> and that means it's got to be a question of, for example, does everybody get to download on a USB stick from their workstation, or only some people? Do you sometimes need to have dual authentication to be able to, to bring certain data down? And is your system architected so that a single person can't bring that information out and download it without getting that second person involved? You know, it's like the old dual key system they have with respect to nuclear missiles. Um, to what extent do you have biometric authentication or multi-factor authentication? Again, these are all part of the architecture which implements your policy. And finally, we get to operations. Once you have all these in place, you've got to have the ability to monitor it, to prioritize what needs to be looked at, to respond when there's an incident, because there will always be an incident, and to be continuously aware of changes that might put you on alert that something more is going on. And again, a piece of operations is also about intelligence collection. Now here I'm talking about tactical intelligence. Because one of the interesting things about at least some of the people who engage in attacks is they talk among themselves. And sometimes what they do is they marshal um, other people who are like-minded to come help them carry out the attack. A lot of this is available on open source. Some of it is available from the government. Some of it may be accessible if you are properly monitoring your own networks and you see changes in behavior, increases, for example, in certain kind of traffic, from which you can learn that there are certain characteristic patterns. To put it in a different way, you know, I, no matter how complicated the machine, there's still a human being involved. And human beings always have the same characteristic. They have what the police call a modus operandi, what people in the casino business call a tell. There's something about the way they operate that tends to repeat a pattern. And if you can pick that up, that can also be a very valuable intelligence element. So the operational capability to continuously monitor, the operational capability to assimilate and integrate and apply intelligence, all of this is the lifeblood of what will then take the architecture and the policies and make them implementable in the real world. So a couple of other uh, observations before I, I open it up to questions. One thing that will be evident from what I've talked about so far is the huge amount of data that you need to be able to understand and manage in order to really get the benefit, particularly of the integration of intelligence, uh, behavior across a large enterprise, um, even the interplay between physical and cyber, for example, when someone's workstation is operating and the person's badge indicates they haven't been in the building, duh, that's a sign there's something you've got to look at. The integration of all of this, plus the assimilation of what is received from external sources like the government or external vendors, this is a lot of data. So as with many other areas, the ability to manage and analyze big data is crucial across all four levels of what I'm talking about. It's crucial in terms of understanding strategy. It's crucial in terms of understanding how you ought to modify or update your policies and procedures. And it's certainly critical at the architectural and operational level because, again, as I said at the very beginning, collection of information is useless if you can't actually understand it and operationalize it and turn it into something that actually has real value. So 
That is, in my mind, a whole enterprise approach to cybersecurity. It's one that is not technical, although there's a technical dimension. It's not just human beings, although there's a human being dimension. It involves not just hardware and software, but strategy and policies. And it has to engage people at every single level of the enterprise. Now, you know, I get asked sometimes, with all the news discussion and publicity about cyber attacks and data theft, and literally every day, there's another story about this. Why isn't more being done? And I think the answer is, um, we've not done a very good job of explaining what is reasonable to expect, <coughs> and um, we've not done a very good job in empowering people to feel they can manage the risk of data theft and data-based attacks. And when I say manage the risk, I think that's critically important. Because anybody who tells you that they can absolutely prevent anybody from stealing your data, uh, the only way to do that is to have no data. The only people who never get penetrated are people who have nothing worth stealing or nothing worth finding out about or affecting. But like every other field of risk, if you can manage the risk, and particularly if you have a strategy where you're focused on prioritizing the greatest protection for the data that's most important, you can really take a lot of hay off the haystack. And so you've got to give people a sense, first of all, what is a reasonable expectation. The second thing you've got to give people a sense is that they are empowered to do something about it. And this is where I think in many ways the plethora of products, um, if you've read the paper, you know, now we're now in a new frenzy of purchasing, quote, cybersecurity companies. Many of them have terrific products. But again, if you're a civilian and someone is advertising or throwing at you all kinds of suggestions, how do you decide what to do? It's like if you want to buy a car, and instead of buying the car, someone says, here's a great set of tires, here's a great carburetor, you know, here's a great piston. You build the car yourself. What it's about is empowering people by giving them a way of thinking through what they need in the context of the enterprise, which is, of course, what I've been talking about. Finally, I mean, I find that one of the useful ways to give people a sense of both empowerment and maybe a little bit of wonderment is to talk about what I think is the single best model for protecting your data or protecting against cyber attacks or things of that sort. And it's not devised by anybody in the United States or really anybody in any country in the world. Um, if you're religious, you believe it's God. If you're not, you believe it's evolution. It is your human body. Your human body is equipped to defend itself against viruses, bacteria, and other um, unpleasant attacks. Now, how does it do that? It doesn't do perimeter defense, although you do have skin and other organs that keep a lot of bad stuff out. But it, it's built, it's configured in such a way that it expects that there's going to be some penetration. And of course, in line with the strategy, the most important stuff, your brain and your heart, are protected with a hard skull and ribs. And stuff that's less important gets a little bit less protection. Um, and then you have an architecture in your system and a continuous monitoring operation that always see what's coming in and say, oh, this is a good bacteria. Oh, this is an okay bacteria, up oh, this is bad, let's kill it. And again, like many of our cyber systems, uh, it's adaptable. Uh, you'll get a zero day exploit in this month's or, or this year's strain of flu, but once you get the flu or you get immunized, you recognize the signature and your body will kill it when it comes in. And it expects that you, there'll be constant exposure to, to attacks and that's in fact how the defense system is configured to make itself better and better. In fact, they say if you keep people in a sterile environment when they're little, you actually handicap their ability to defend themselves. And finally, it's not to say that the body is perfect and there are illnesses and things that strike us down and kill us. But as a risk management system, it has all the elements of what I'm talking about. It's configured, well, the strategy comes from maybe a higher authority, but the uh, governance and the policy in terms of your protection, your architecture, um, all of that fits together, and then your operating system plays off that architecture. And in fact, um, you know, when you break a bone, it gets stronger in that place. It'll actually 
make modifications in the architecture based upon past experience. So what I leave you with is this thought. Um, we can empower people. We can uh, help people manage risk. But what's important to do is to make sure we are honest about what they can expect, to remove the jargon and sometimes the technical element and talk about the human element. And most important to remind people that this is not a one vector problem. It is a 360 degree problem, an outside problem and an inside problem. And therefore it requires an approach that just like your body thinks about all of the possible challenges and configures itself to deal with them. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. And there's some mics in the, in the center. And if you have questions, just mention, you know, who you are and where you're from would be helpful. I felt sure I was going to get questions about NSA and Snowden and stuff like that. My name is Andrew Winston, University of Texas, Austin. You mentioned the idea of managing risk, uh, but you didn't mention anything about creating new kinds of insurance companies that would work with companies to help them manage risk, to impose certain requirements in their operations along the lines that you outlined, which would allow them to collect uh, collect if there were failures that would occur? Well, I think that's actually, um, it's a, 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 I think, a useful observation. Um, the insurance market for cyber risk has not developed, uh, fully developed yet. Part of that is the difficulty, as I said, in fully understanding what the risks are, and maybe more important from the insurance standpoint, in quantifying those risks. But I will say, and I can say this based partly on my own work, I think there is interest now in providing um, insurance, and maybe more important, coupled with that, guidance on cybersecurity that would allow you to buy insurance at a reasonable premium level. Because the way to drive behavior with enterprises in many cases is not to say, oh, if you don't do this, a bad thing is going to happen, but to say, you can buy insurance and your premium will be lower if you do the right thing. So I will say there are a number of people now who are working with the insurance industry, A, to figure out what would be the kind of coverage with insurance. You know, what would be a reasonable element of coverage? Is it just the um, uh, cost of, for example, repairing credit when data is lost? Is there a loss of competitive advantage? Is there a loss to third parties? That's one set of issues. And then the second set of issues is what then would be, just as in the case of fire insurance, the requirements that the insurance industry would generate in order to allow people to get a reduced premium or a reduced benefit, which of course is the insurance model. So I, I do think that's a very, very important um, set of discussions and one which I think will help contribute to the overall increase in security in the ecosystem. Yes. Yes, uh, I'm Murray Jennings from San Diego State. Uh, I agree with the insurance part, but I also believe we need to have more responsibility and more accountability by companies that collect data, such as Target. What will be, how will Target be held accountable for what happened? Well, I think, you know, without getting into a particular company, um, I, and I say this to people a lot, um, you know, right now the U.S. government or Congress has not passed any general set of standards or legal requirements with respect to cybersecurity. Um, I actually argued that it would be in the, in the um, to the benefit of businesses to have that done because ultimately otherwise liability will be set by 12 jurors sitting in a box after an event has happened. Now, um, you know, I don't know in this particular case what the cause of the breach was um, and ultimately who may be responsible. What I do know is that um, after the fact tort litigation, 
is probably the least transactionally efficient way to allocate responsibility and drive responsible behavior. Now, sometimes it winds up being the only way, um, but it's particularly difficult when you deal with an interdependent um, system where failure along a lot of different lines may be responsible for what the problem is. Is it configuration? Is it hardware, software? Is it some human being inside who did something? Is it someone further down the supply chain? Um, but I suspect, what, you know, you have had cases, for example, where it happened with Sony, and I think it's happening with some of the retailers now, where they've had to expend a considerable amount of money um, in terms of uh, helping people repair credit or monitor credit and things of that sort. And that does impact the bottom line. I continue to think, though, it's better to prevent than to repair. And I still think the biggest obstacle uh, in getting companies to invest sufficiently is not so much that they don't understand that they need to do something, but they don't know exactly what they should do, they don't know how much is enough, and they feel disempowered. And often the reaction then is to say, you know what, I can't figure it out, I don't know how much is enough, I'm just gonna put my head in the sand and hope that the law of large numbers protects me from an attack. Yes. Okay, I'm Wolf Bein from uh, the ninth island of Hawaii, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I would like to ask a more political question and uh, I have no malintent, so I really just would like an answer. Um, what do you think is the greater threat, a nuclear terrorist attack or climate change? Um, well, climate change is a little bit further away from cyber. Um, I, think, I think a nuclear terrorist attack is a, look, if you had a nuclear terrorist attack, that would be a cataclysm particularly in a big city. Um, and, and this is not the place to get into the whole issue of uh, EMPs, but you could have a huge impact on our electronics. Um, <coughs> the likelihood is it's not impossible. It's relatively remote <coughs> because they either have to be given a bomb or they'd have to steal a bomb. I don't think they could make a bomb. Now, could they be given a bomb or steal a bomb? It's possible. I mean, we have nuclear powers in the world now that are a little bit um, <clears throat> less than fully stable, and we're dealing with a proliferation issue, as you now see in Iran. And the more you proliferate nuclear devices, the greater the risk. I would say in the near term, uh, the cataclysmic um, attack I'd be more worried about is, frankly, a cyber attack, an attack on significant <clears throat> um, energy assets, transportation assets, financial aspects could have a very, very, very serious effect <clears throat> globally as well as on individual countries. And that is not a remote possibility. That is a real possibility. You know, there was recently a, um, an alert that went around that uh, the Department of Homeland Security put out about malicious exploits found on natural gas pipelines. And now, what was the intent? Was it to simply to monitor and get intelligence? Or was it designed to put something that does reconnaissance so that somebody could talk about maybe shutting down uh, energy pipelines for a period of time? And if you're, you came here from the east, imagine what would be going on right now with you know, uh, polar temperatures if all of a sudden natural gas was turned off. That's really what I'd be more worried about. Yes, I think we have time for maybe one more. I see someone coming over to the... I'll make this very fast, okay. Mr. Secretary. Two more. Okay, yeah, go ahead. How would you uh, deal with issues that are treason, like Snowden or uh, uh, private uh, who leaked the information to WikiLeaks, uh, which is pretty difficult to deal with? Or w is that a bigger problem, or is that the perpetual ignorance of... Uh, students, kids, our students, who really place no importance whatsoever on their privacy <clears throat> or the privacy of anyone to, to whom they send email? Well, two separate questions. I mean, I, look, I, 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 my own view is Snowden and Manning broke the law if they, you know, ever are apprehended, well, Manning's in jail. 
Um, if Snowden's ever apprehended, he should face a trial. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't buy the argument that he's, quote, motivated by a good thing, um, and therefore you let him off. I'll remind you that in uh, about 50, 60 years ago, when the atomic spies, Fuchs, and the Rosenbergs stole the atomic secrets and gave them to the Soviets. They were motivated because they believed that world peace would be served by giving the Soviet Union an atomic bomb, um, and they were tried for treason and, and, and executed. So I, I don't buy that motive. I do think, though, that we need to do a lot better job educating people about privacy doesn't even begin to talk about it. The value of the data that people generate is enormous. It's got commercial value. Uh, it's got personal value. It can have a real impact on their lives. And as we talked about a little bit at lunch, um, you know, there's a lot of grumbling about uh, the government collecting telephone data and not even looking at it unless there's a, a, a specific reason. And there were only apparently 220 times over the last few years they've looked at, even looked at it. And that's trivial data. Commercial enterprises now collect enormous amounts of data. People barely understand what's collected about them, and it can be used for all kinds of reasons, whether it's determining how much your insurance ought to cost, deciding whether you ought to get a mortgage, figuring out what to charge you for an airline flight, and these are totally invisible to the average person. So I think we need to do a lot better job educating. If you want to talk about transparency, I think we need a lot more transparency about what is done with commercial data. And I think it's no surprise that if you look at the companies now with the biggest market capitalization, you have energy companies like oil and gas, and you have data companies, which are basically collecting data and selling it. So I think we've got a lot of education to do. Yeah, in the back. Uh, Merrill Workington, Mississippi State University. You talk about strategy and governance and architecture, but where the rubber meets the road, I talk to security managers who only have enough resources to deal with compliance at the organizational level and individual level. So to a certain extent, you're preaching to the choir here. We buy into this. I want to know when the camera's not here and you're sitting down with a CEO that you're advising, what's your pitch? What's your, what's your advice to him? Uh, and I'm especially interested in insider abuse and the insider threat, but how do you convince them to increase the resource level to address something that they <coughs> should be thinking about before the fire's there that they have to put out? Well, I'm, I, I think there are two things I say. And, I, and by the way, I sit on boards and I'm chairman of a, of a defense company, so I mean, I, I, I'm both a consumer and a client as well as an advisor and a, and a, a person who um, consults. Um, first, and this is actually the easy part, I talk about what's already happened out there and the consequences for companies that have found themselves on the receiving end of a serious attack. But that comes to my second point. If you don't give people a solution, you just give them a problem, you get a head shake. And it's, it's easy to have people say, okay, I'm going to turn it over to my technical people. What I mean by a solution is this. Exactly what I've talked about. Explaining to them in terms of their business and their business goals that security and cyber data protection is an enabler and why it's important. Giving them a choice, giving them a range of options. I never tell people, you have to do this. I say, here are the trade-offs. Here's your rank of importance, here's the cost, um, and here, here are what the trade-offs are. How much to invest? I'm honest with people about what do you get for a certain investment, and that the fact that there's a marginal gain that decreases over time. And finally, and I have to say in this case, I think the Snowden experience was a wake-up call. <clears throat> um, you have to have a candid conversation about the insider threat. Many of the problems that enterprises face come from either poorly educated employees or malevolent employees. And that raises all kinds of issues about, including legal issues, about how do you measure what employees are doing on the network? Can you look to see what they're doing in their own time? You know, if they're, if they're part of some, you know, group that's got a, a strong agenda of some kind, is that uh, something you're entitled to consider? And there's some legal issues here which are kind of beyond the scope of my, of my talk today. But in the end, to me, it's about a, what I started out with. You've got to give people a roadmap, realistic, not telling them this is a panacea, because it won't be, 
but that gives them, that under, explains to them in plain English how this level of investment is going to draw down your risk a significant degree. And then they have to decide how much risk they're prepared to take. And they might be prepared to take more risk with respect to some data than with other data. Uh, but if you don't demystify it, and that's the reason I want to talk to an audience like this, because this is a very technical engineering uh, audience. You understand this stuff. You understand it probably better than I do from a technical standpoint. If you can't make it English, and you can't talk to civilians and put it in a larger context, and emphasize the human non-technical piece, then you're going to be facing kind of a blank look and uh, um, a kind of someone's going to point to the head of the of, you know, CISO and say, well, that's his problem. So that's, that's what I do. That's my solution. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate your attentiveness and enjoy the rest of the conference.